Well, good morning, Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Church. Those of you who realize what I represent will immediately be able to put a finger on a mistake I've just made. And I wonder if you all realize what I have said. The last time I was here, we formally organized you as Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Company. And today I should be greeting you as Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Company. But when I drove into your parking lot this morning, I saw that the sign said something different. It said Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Church. When I picked up the bulletin, in fact, when you emailed the bulletin to me earlier this week, I also noticed Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Church. And those of you who know some of the process that we follow in the Seventh-day Adventist Church will realize that we don't quickly form, organize a church. It takes time. And a company, in fact, we start with a group. And then we become a company. And there's certain criteria that we look at and it's not that we love to keep bureaucracy in place, but in most cases, it takes quite a while to go from group to company to church. And there are steps along that path. And your particular leaders and your pastor, Jerry Joubert, have been very, very active in prodding us and have submitted a document to us, a thick one like that, of the reasons why we should go the next step. And it's my privilege to let you know that the Executive Committee of the Oregon Conference on, thirst, on Thursday, just two days ago, voted to approve your status as a church. And the next step will be the formality of that. And we will meet on a Sabbath yet to be determined. And we will put a lot of good reasons together why we should celebrate. And so uh, I just wanted to share that with you. I have not even told Pastor Jerry yet. He doesn't deserve to know because he's not in this country. <laughs> but he did know that it was on the agenda. And uh, when it gets at least to the agenda, it's a good sign. But I will be emailing him sometime today just to bring him into the loop, unless you do it before I. <laughs> but I wanted to share that with you this morning, because I know it is on the hearts particularly of the leaders uh, of this, this congregation, and uh, it is an important step. And... I want to thank you on behalf of the Oregon Conference for being a church family and for being the light that you are and uh, the, the salt that you are in this community and pray that you will further let that grow as God directs you. I do want to share with you, but first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. Um, you know, you may think that we get into all the churches of our conference. It doesn't happen that way. I'm the kind of person who only goes where I'm invited. And um, it's, thank you for inviting me. I, I appreciate that. It gives me an opportunity to get a feel for who you are. I've been here once before, as I say, it was a formal day and uh, just sitting in the Sabbath school class today, you get a feel for the kind of conversation, the kind of things that are in your hearts and in your lives. But I must honestly say, I don't really know you as individuals. And it is true that we each come from so many different circumstances. We each come from particular life journeys. And I'm cognizant of that this morning as we meet together as a church family and it is for that reason that I particularly ask you to join me in prayer that we ask God's word to touch your life and my life today and guide and direct us individually. God knows 
what you need, God knows what I need today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, with the very different life journeys that are represented in this church sanctuary this morning, with the many different burdens that may be on, on our hearts, with the many different joys that we celebrate of so many things that happen in our lives, the communities that we represent, the families that we represent, the people that we represent, and who we are. Somehow your spirit has, has drawn us to this place and to this time. And here we are, in your presence. And we humbly ask that as we open your word, that your word will indeed shape, inform, guide, impact each of our lives. Because your Holy Spirit inspired this word and we pray that that same Holy Spirit will motivate it in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. Because you are God and we belong to you. And we open our hearts to you this morning and ask you to fill and impress. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you for reading that scripture this morning. It's perhaps not the most positive verse in scripture. It's about somebody dying. It's about the end of their life. Or is it? It's Moses. And it's Moses at a particular time when, yes, at the end of his life he's looking back. And some of you might be looking back a lot more than looking forward. If you're around my age, you kind of look back quite a bit. Quite a bit. It's, it's the way it happens. And I think Moses looked back on the way that he had led, and God had led him leading the people, the church, the church administrator. And here he finds himself on this mountain called Mount Nebo. And on the top of Mount Nebo, this height called Pisgah. Let me ask you, do you remember singing these words, till from Mount Pisgah's lofty heights, I view my home and take my flight. In my immortal flesh, I rise to seize what the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air, farewell, farewell, what? What hymn is that? Sweet hour of prayer. It's a rather strange set of words to be singing in church, isn't it? Have you ever thought of what you were singing when you sang that? Is there a time that we should be rejoicing and shouting to the world and to the air, farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer? I thought we were striving to be a people of prayer. And here we are singing farewell, farewell. But you know, we sing strange things sometimes and we don't think about them. But it is appropriate for someone poised to enter eternity, a new set of relationships with God where our past experience was dependent on praying with God in his presence for power, for life, for sustenance, for everything. And now in eternity, our prayer life will change. Am I correct? I'm, I think so. I think there's something different about the way we pray in eternity. It'll be different. And so we do sing Farewell, farewell, sweet hour of prayer. But the Pisgah referred to here uses the imagery of what we've just read in Deuteronomy. Moses is standing on Mount Pisgah, on Mount Nebo. They are kind of interchangeable. 
And God meets with Moses at the end of his earthly life and says, Moses, I want to show you the picture of the church ahead of you. And sometimes we, especially in leadership in a congregation, are particularly concerned about the picture of our church ahead of us. We should be. We should be. We are responsible. We are leaders. And we who are members should also be concerned about how we portray a picture of God when we are church. And the picture ahead is God's privilege and joy to share with us in some ways quite explicitly and in other ways maybe in a strange revelation. But here we are standing with Moses at a particular time of Moses' life where he's looking back and he's wondering now what is going to happen to church from this point on and God does the strangest thing he says you know what you are not going to lead this church <laughs> got something else in mind for you and I'm not even going to tell you that but I am going to show you a picture of church ahead of us Joshua is going to do it you are not going over but I have something different. But I do want to share a picture of church. Now, think a little bit with me. This is the church leader standing on Mount Nebo. God is with him. He's led this group of people through a journey of redemption. And God is showing him where to from here. And God says to Moses in this text, I want to show you the big picture. It's something like where we are perhaps at the beginning of a new birthday year. We want to look ahead, maybe the beginning of a year, maybe, maybe it's the beginning of a month, like we are transitioning from April into May 2012, and even just next week, the, the, the road ahead, and God says to Moses, I will, I have let you see it with your eyes. And I wonder, what did Moses see? What did Moses see? How much detail did God reveal to Moses? What did he actually see? Was it simply him standing there on an elevated position and looking at the geography in front of him. Now I need to get you aligned, oriented this morning. And in the process I'm going to have to disorient you. So concentrate. I'm going to say I'm standing on Mount Nebo. Well let me ask you, where's north? Right, we have some confusion here. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't, where's north? Is it that way somewhere? Okay. For the purposes of this, this presentation, this sermon, hear me clearly, north is there. <laughs> All right? Just for today, north is there. I'm standing on Mount Nebo, north is there, so where's south? I need you to be sure of that. That's south. So where is west? That way and east by elimination is behind me. All right. I'm standing on Mount Nebo. There's a huge big valley in front of me going past from north to south. And in the center of that valley is a snaking river. What's the name of the river? All right, if you are confused, you might like to look in your Bibles, and you're welcome to look at the Bible and see at the back if there's a map there. But the river goes from north to south, correct? At the north, there is a body of water. What would we call it? The Sea of Galilee. Got it? It's just over there, Sea of Galilee. 
The Jordan River leaves the Sea of Galilee, comes right down here in front of us, and then goes into what? The Dead Sea, down there, right here. It's no aspersion to who you are. <laughs> but there's the Dead Sea, there's Galilee, and there's the Jordan River flowing right in front of me. You are on the other side of the Jordan. I am looking down from Mount Nebo at this valley in front of me. All right. Where's Jerusalem? There. About there is Jerusalem. Okay? Where's Jericho? It's about there. From where I'm standing. It's about there. And you go up from Jericho, like the Bible says, to Jerusalem. And believe me, you go up. It's quite a difference. Let me give you an idea of the kind of difference. Mount Nebo, about 26, 2700 feet. That's where I am. Mount Hermon, right up past Galilee, if, you, if it's a very clear day, you might see the, the snow on top of, of, of Mount Hermon. 7,300 feet, right up there. The Mount of Olives, which is just over there, is about the same altitude as where I am on Mount Nebo. It's over there. The Dead Sea is 13, 1,400 feet below sea level. Got that? It's way down there. And the whole valley is way down there below sea level. What did Moses see? Was it simply a physical, geographical panorama of mountains in the distance, across the valley, the river down here, Galilee, Dead Sea? Is that what he saw? A city down there called Jericho? I wonder what it was that God revealed to Moses when he said to Moses, you will see it with your eyes. I wonder what detail. I have reason to believe that it is more than simply a geographical panorama. It was more than Moses just taking his camera and taking pictures and stitching them into a panorama. For those of you who have done that kind of digital stuff. It was more than Moses just looking around from south to north and seeing the physical attributes of the land. I wonder if he saw a historical panorama. Because in this text it refers, amongst others, to Abraham. And I wonder if, I wonder if Moses saw the story of Abraham who had wandered with his extended family in those very mountains over there and left altars to testify to his praise of God and worship of the true God. I wonder if he saw Abraham. I wonder if he saw Isaac. I wonder if he saw Jacob. I wonder if he saw Abraham pursuing a promise and realizing that God had given a promise to this people, this church, a promise of a land to settle in, to go over to. And I wonder if he felt a little twinge of Abraham had been in pursuit of a promise that he didn't achieve. Do you remember that about Abraham? And here I am, Moses, and I'm not going over. Twinge of disappointment, maybe. What did he see? Did he see in not just the historical panorama, did, he st did God start to reveal to, to, to Moses what was going to happen? That right down there where the Jordan is just on the other side is Jericho, that Joshua was going to lead his church, our church, across to Jericho. And you know the story about Jericho. I wonder how much detail he saw. Did he see people walking through on dry land there? And did that remind him of how he walked on dry land through this place called the Red Sea? Did that connect in any way as God showed it to him and as he saw it with his eyes? 
What did he see? What did, what did Moses see? I wonder if he saw across those mountains there, I wonder if he saw what was to become Bethlehem. Where's Bethlehem, by the way? Here's Jerusalem, and Bethlehem is right there. Okay? Just a little bit that side of, from my perspective. I wonder if he saw what was going to become Bethlehem and Jerusalem. I wonder if he saw a young boy, a shepherd boy, writing songs called Psalms. And I wonder if he saw David and David writing these Psalms like Psalm 139 verse 5. And I wonder if he saw the wording and the picture that David was describing as David wrote, you Lord, you, you hem me in from behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. And I wonder if that wasn't a promise to Moses as he thought of his own life. God, you have my back covered. You know where I have been. God, you know my future. You've got my future planned. And God, this day, you lay your hand upon me. And I wonder if that wasn't a, a promise as, da as he saw David and he saw the kind of message that David was going to write and sing. Lord, you hem me in. And I wonder if your life and my life doesn't see that same promise from God, no matter where you are today and what your life circumstances are this day, that God says, I hem you in, I totally surround you, I undergird you, I shadow you, I am your all surround God, I know where you come from, I know all that stuff. I know where you are going to. I have a plan for your life. And you know what? In my presence this day, I simply lay my hand of blessing on you. And I wonder if Moses didn't feel that in God's presence on Mount Nebo as he looked at the story that was being unfolded in front of him. I wonder how much detail Moses saw of God's big picture as God was trying to show him the picture of the church, his big picture. I wonder if he saw this little place called Bethlehem and a Christ child born right there. I wonder if, I wonder if Moses saw the star. Maybe. I don't know all the detail he saw. But I do have reason to believe that God was opening up to him more than just a physical panorama in front of him. That he was showing him, and you can read this in the book Desire of Ages. It's amazing what is spelt out there. It's a fascinating little episode of Moses' end of life. I wonder if he saw this Christ child's journey from Bethlehem, right there, to Calvary, right there. I wonder if he saw the journey. I wonder if he saw Jesus in Nazareth. You remember where Nazareth is? Just to the west of the bottom part of the Sea of Galilee, a little village called Nazareth. And Jesus grew up there. I wonder how much detail Moses saw of Jesus growing up. I don't have an answer, but it fascinates me. I wonder if he saw Jesus being baptized right down here in the Jordan. Well, they tell us it's about there. It could be, I don't mind. But I wonder if Moses saw Jesus being baptized in that muddy river, the place of miracle, the place where Joshua went across, probably quite close. One day, I wonder if, if Moses saw that. I wonder if he saw the ministry episodes in the life of Jesus 
the disciples growing and becoming leaders in the church. I wonder if he saw a little village called Capernaum. You have to, on a very, on a very clear day, you might see Capernaum. The reason why it's, it's not so clear is that it's on the Sea of Galilee, but it's right up there on the northwesternmost corner of the Sea of Galilee, a little village called Capernaum. And one of the interesting disciples there is a name, person by the name of Peter. You remember Peter? Peter's profession, a fisherman. I wonder if Moses saw Peter being called to be a fisher of men. I wonder if he saw that. And in Capernaum, there's a, little, there's a home there, not far from the synagogue. And that home is, is the home of Peter. Or maybe Peter's mother-in-law. But you know, maybe Peter was seen as the owner of the home. But interesting, the Bible describes Jesus as regarding that same home as his home. And the Bible actually says when Jesus went to his home in Capernaum. Where was Jesus? He was from Nazareth, right? But he had a home in Capernaum. And it was Peter's home. And I wonder if Moses didn't see one day how they were gathered in that home and Jesus was there and the disciples were around him and everybody came and packed into that house and there was no room for anybody else and they were all surrounding Jesus. It's a wonderful picture of the church with Jesus at the center and everybody focused on Jesus. But there's a problem. There was somebody who had a need to get to Jesus and I wonder if Moses saw a paralyzed man lying on a stretcher and four of his friends trying desperately to get him to the presence of Jesus and guess what was between them and Jesus the church is that a problem we've got to be careful of that we can be so inwardly focused that we forget, as we spoke this morning, about being the light in our community and also looking out. It's important to look in. It's important to focus. But we also need to reach out. I wonder if Moses saw that kind of detail. And I wonder if Moses saw what these people did. What did they do? The only way to get to Jesus is to break a hole in the roof. Now you've just paid for this church, haven't you? <laughs> Would you tolerate somebody breaking a hole in the roof so that they can get into church? <laughs> That's quite a challenge. Who owns this house that they were gathered? Peter. Peter may have been the very person who built the roof. Now, when they built the roof in those days, it wasn't as neat. It weren't tiles and what we have. It was limbs and branches and sticks and mud packed in and pressed down. And so if you're under, under, underneath a ceiling, when someone is breaking a hole big enough for a stretcher to be lowered, I wonder how much detail Moses saw. <laughs> when this hole starts to emerge do you think you'll know about it there will be all sorts of dirt falling down and when the dirt falls down what happens we step back don't we and guess what an opening space opens up at the foot of Jesus Christ but they had to break a hole in the roof you know what I'm impressed about and I wonder if Moses saw this. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that Peter, when somebody broke a hole in his roof, that Peter lost his cool. How well do you know Peter? A little later on, when somebody tried to arrest Jesus, what did Peter do? He carried a sword, didn't he? The Bible says he chopped his ear off, but he actually was aiming to chop his head off. He missed, I think. I think. 
That's Peter. That's Peter. And yet somehow Peter, in that episode, was starting to get a picture, the bigger picture, God's bigger picture of church. That in that moment, as they were being church, Peter was learning that church is more about forgiveness and healing than it is about the hole in the roof. The hole in the roof is important, believe me. I've been in enough church boards. It's important. And it's important to pay for that and to get it repaired and keep it maintained. But there are more important things when you are church. And Peter was starting to learn that. And I'm so glad that the Bible doesn't give any record of Peter losing his temper because all of a sudden he had to pay for a roof repair. It's an interesting episode. Very soon after that, Jesus was walking on the road. And you see the main highway went through Capernaum and he was right next to the road. There he sees this man by the name of Matthew. What was Matthew's job? His profession was a tax collector. So he was there where the traffic happened, where the people came by. And I wonder if Moses saw Jesus going up to Matthew and just simply saying, Matthew, follow me. And guess what? Matthew up and follows Jesus. As simple as that. I wonder if Moses saw that. I wonder if Moses saw Matthew closing up his money boxes and his ledgers and cash books and whatever you call them, putting them aside and f excitedly following Jesus. I wonder if Moses saw Matthew that very night giving a party for Jesus in his home. Who attended the party, by the way? His friends. Who were his friends? Other tax collectors. And the leaders of the church like the VP for administration from the Oregon conference comes by and says to one of the disciples, why does Jesus eat with tax collectors and sinners? And I wonder if Moses didn't see that Matthew and Peter and a number of other people and maybe a church official was getting the bigger picture of the church. That the church is more about Jesus coming not for the healthy, but for the sick and for the sinner. I wonder if Moses saw that. Matthew got to see that. Peter got to see that. And interestingly, some other people at that very party got to see it. I wonder if back here in Jerusalem, Moses didn't see this church leader by the name of Peter falling, losing it all. One night, one dark night, denying Christ after he had expressly said to Jesus, I will never, never leave you. And that very night... He disowns Jesus. And in the darkness of that night, somehow Jesus simply looks at Peter. And I wonder if Moses saw that. It was that look that made Peter run out to the very place where he had been asked to watch and pray in Gethsemane. And that's where he finds Jesus. And his heart is turned around. I wonder if days later, Moses saw Peter preaching right here in Jerusalem. Right here in Jerusalem. And I wonder if he saw the Holy Spirit turning the hearts of 3,000 people right there in Jerusalem because Peter was talking and the Holy Spirit was working. 3,000 people. I wonder if Moses saw that some of those 3,000 people were the very people who first heard the words of Jesus at Matthew's party. Go read it in Desire of Ages. <laughs> Fascinating. And I wonder if that isn't 
a kind of special sequence evangelism that we were looking at in our Sabbath school lesson this, this week. That somehow God, in his bigger picture of my life, gives, gives me a word. And somehow his Holy Spirit brings germination to that word, maybe days, maybe years later. And I wonder if that isn't happening with you and with me today. That somehow there's a word that God plants. And maybe he planted it some time ago. And maybe it even just takes root today. Because God is guarding and guiding the bigger picture of your life. And of your church. And of your family. And I wonder if God didn't show that to Moses. And I wonder in this whole bigger picture, right there in the middle of Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Church, if Moses didn't see a crucifixion scene and the cross of Jesus Christ, this pivotal historic moment in the big story of the church, in this thing we call a great controversy, and I wonder if Moses didn't see that picture happening right there as he stood on Mount Nebo. He'd led the church. He'd built a sanctuary. And what was in the sanctuary? A number of pointers. And it started to come together. And if there's anything, if there's any detail that Moses saw and that God revealed to Moses, it had to be the cross of Jesus Christ. In Jerusalem and the cross of Jesus Christ in the middle of Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Church. Maybe that's what he saw. And maybe he did see from Mount Nebo a group of people in this area called Central Oregon meeting as Cascade Seventh-day Adventist Church with a sense of mission, sense of purpose, and gathered around Jesus and mobilized by Jesus and Jesus at the center. And I wonder if Moses didn't see that about us today. I wonder if he doesn't see that bigger picture in each of our lives. My wife Shirley and I were on a, a trip with a number of our members, our church members, and we were doing a, a visit to a number of Bible lands. And we were in the, in the hotel room in the city of Cairo. And that day we'd flown down to Luxor. Those of you who've done that kind of uh, visit, we'd flown down to Luxor. We'd seen all the things that, all the Tutankhamun places. And we'd come back, and uh, very late that night, Walked into the room and there's this little flashing light. What does it say to you? There's a message for you. I don't need messages at the end of a long Sunday. <laughs> and I got the message. It said I must contact somebody by the name of Al Reimke. Who some of you I think realize is the president of the Oregon Conference. And I got in touch with him, and um, he gave me disturbing news. The disturbing news, and I used that word intentionally, the disturbing news was that he invited me to be on his team in the administration of the Oregon Conference. I'll tell you why it was disturbing. Because I had been... Before I came to Oregon, I had been in church and in institutional administration for more than a decade. And I had had the singular pleasure and privilege and experience, richness of experience, of being called to be a pastor in the church. It was a privilege. The best place of ministry <laughs> Why? Because it reminded me again during those six years that I was pastoring, six and a half or whatever it was, years I was pastoring in Portland, Oregon, it reminded me again that church is not in a conference office or even in a college campus. That's not really where church is. Church is 
in the pews of a local congregation. That's where church is. This is church. This is church. And to be closely associated with leading church at this level is a much higher privilege. It is disturbing for me to be invited to go down to the conference. You got that drift. <laughs> and um, I was wrestling with this, really struggling with this. In addition to that, both my wife and I were pastoring together. And that was an unusual privilege for us. And so we had a decision to make. And I was wrestling. That very next morning, early in the morning, we boarded a plane in Cairo airport. And we flew to Amman, Jordan. Now, when you fly to Amman, Jordan, you have a number of choices. We happened to be in Royal Jordanian Airline. They are the one airline in the world that make economy class feel like business class, even first class. You, you sit there and, and the leather feels like my body wants. <laughs> it was very comfortable and I'm flying up there but I'm wrestling with this and I'm looking out the window and we go flying across what I recognize is the Red Sea. Is there somebody who'd done that journey, that journey before? Moses? Right? And a group of people? And I looked over this arid desert, and there down there, it was as dry, as dry as you can think of it. And as I looked down there, I imagined seeing little children walking on dry ground with walls of seawater about them, holding on to their parents' hands. And I was looking down and saying, Lord, did you have this bird's eye perspective, this big picture of families, of children, of the church as they were going into this unknown experience? And it came to me that if God can guard the lives of little children and parents and families and church as they go into the unknown, the uncomfortable zones of life, then he can guard and guide my life when I don't know what to decide. We landed in Jordan that afternoon. We took a coach that took us north of Amman, Jordan. Now you've got to think a little bit of where that is because we crossed a little river, a little stream. It began with the name J. Anybody know what that is? It's not the Jordan. It's a Jabbok. Anybody remember what happened at Jabbok? I was right there at the Jabbok River. It happened to somebody by the name of Jacob, another J. Jacob at the Jabbok River. Not in broad daylight, in the darkness of night. And he wrestles at the Jabbok River with God. You remember that? And he wrestles until God gives him light in the morning. Because he didn't know what to do and where he was going. And I said to myself, if God can give light to the dark, dark world of confused Jacob, he can give light to my confusion today. And shortly after that, a day or two later, we were standing on a view site. The name of the view site was Mount Nebo. Do you know where Mount Nebo is? And as I stood right here at Mount Nebo, I looked over a valley in front of me. What was down there? Dead Sea. What was up there? Galilee, I saw it. What was going down here? What town was over there? Jericho. What town was over there? 
couldn't really see it. It was across the mountains, but I knew it was there. And I looked down and realized that the whole of God's church history on this earth the huge chunk of it had taken place right here in front of me. And I simply said to myself, if God can guard and guide the story of his church in this valley over so many thousands of years, then he can guard and guide the story of what he wants in and through me in my life today. And I took courage. I don't know where you are today. Maybe somebody is facing a big decision today. I don't know. Maybe there's something that you just don't know what to do about. Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's your parent. You just don't know how to deal with a situation. If God can watch over the story of so many people and the story of his church, he says to us today, I hem you in from before and from behind and I lay my hand upon you. I know where you've been. I know what the problem is. I know what lies ahead. I have a plan. Take courage. This day, I lay my hand upon you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, whatever it is that we are faced with, individually, maybe it's a work situation and our corporate challenges. Maybe it's a family situation and our family, my family may be struggling. Maybe, maybe it's my child. Maybe it's the future of my child and I'm worried about it. Maybe it's as a church we have questions about the future. As a conference we wonder and we are concerned Father, in your presence today, we humbly look to you and say thank you for hemming us in. Thank you for completely surrounding us. Thank you for watching over our past. Thank you for covering our past. Thank you for forgiving our past. Thank you for leading and the way you have led us in the past. And thank you for the courage that this gives to us, the hope that we have for the future. That we may know that you are going to guide. And why do we know? Because today, this Sabbath morning, in your presence, we accept your promise that you lay your hand upon us. That blessing is too precious for words. And we pursue it today and we will pursue it tomorrow. But we thank you for it. And we praise you. As we leave this place, may we leave with the knowledge that God our Heavenly Father loves us intensely. May your Holy Spirit frequently remind us of this fact of your love. And then Lord, don't let us ever forget that we are totally dependent upon the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Jesus Christ who is at the center of our church. The Jesus Christ who motivates us to reach out. And the Jesus Christ who is coming again. We look to you and thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.